Just a reminder, this is a open public meeting. Everyone's welcome. However, this is not being screened, although it is being recorded. Uh, the only people that are seeing the screen in front of us is us. We do have some staff that are participating remotely, but just uh, uh, bear with me here and we'll uh, get everybody introduced if everybody's ready and can uh, uh, pay a little bit of attention here. We'll. Uh, are you ready, Sophia? Holly, we're ready? Everybody on this end? Okay. So let's uh, go ahead and uh, just uh, again, for the record, this is a, a meeting of the Washington State Parks and Recreation Commission. We're meeting today at uh, Cama Beach. I uh, want to thank uh, Jeff and the staff here for uh, being well prepared for us. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the foundation. Our friend here is actually a foundation, as I'm sure you all know, for the great decorations. Be sure to take a look at the Christmas building and the display over here. Some people went through a lot of work uh, to make this building look beautiful, and they've done a great job. Uh, we're going to just do a quick round of self-introductions, and we're going to introduce everybody in the room. So, Mike, why don't we start with you, and we'll just intermingle staff and commissioners. Mike, please. Mike Sturbeck, Deputy Director. Mike Crimmins, Operations Director. Mike Lauer. Builders, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Ken Commissioner Stanley. Mark Brown, Commissioner Lacey. Diana Dupuy, Director. Holly Williams, Commissioner of Vancouver, Washington. Sophia Danenberg, Commissioner of Whitby Island. Laura Holmes, Administrative Services Director. Heather Saunders, Parks Development Director. And uh, Stet is over here. We have a, I hope it's right, but Stet, why don't you go ahead. Stet Palmer. Who's the new role? Hear from our friends with fossils, like, uh, friends of uh, Lake Sylvia and State Park, and uh, good to see you, Stan. We do have um, one commissioner participating virtually. Lori, would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning, Lori Conley from Spokane. And in, uh, my understanding, we have three of our wonderful staff joining us remotely. Uh, and see you, Lisa. Would you introduce yourself, please? Good morning, Lisa Lance, Stewardship Director. And I understand Amanda, you are with us, is that correct? She will be later. Oh, she'll be joining us later, all right. And Becky, our missing executive assistant. Becky, are you there? I'm here. And as we all know, and as group this morning, we literally can't function without you, but we understand that both you and Lori are sick and we wish you both well. Uh, thanks for uh, participating to the extent you're able to do How do you get COVID from deer? That's what I do COVID from deer. Mm -hmm. um, just a quick review of the agenda and some logistics. You have the agenda for some time. Just to remind you that um, Ranger Jeff is going to lead us in some kind of a gingerbread making uh, exercise at 5 o'clock. So uh, if we get done early and have a little break, please be back here at 5. Dinner will be at 6. And then we'll have our little Christmas program and gift exchange following that. Uh, bathrooms are down the hallway here. And Becky, were there any other logistics that we need to talk about? That was it. All right. Um, and then tomorrow morning we'll be here bright and early at 9 a.m. and breakfast once again at 8 a.m. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so let's see, agenda, back to logistics. So the executive committee in putting together this agenda pretty much stuck with what we've been using uh, over the years. Uh, maybe a few little tweaks, but essentially we've used this template uh, for a long time. And so the first thing that we've done historically is we have the current chair uh, talk a little bit about the uh, year and uh, the accomplishments. And I've uh, devoted a little bit of time to doing this. And the good news is I'm not going to take a full half hour, but I do want to make a few comments. Um, I would say from my perspective, and I hope you all agree, that it's a given it's been a very busy year. I'm not sure we had a record number of executive sessions, but because of the hiring a new director, uh, we must have come close, although I do think last year probably is the high watermark for executive sessions. But uh, near record number of meetings, but I think more importantly, I think we 
had a successful year. Um, I had a chance to review the 2022 priorities and thought it would be interesting to try to prepare my remarks this morning by looking at the minutes of our meetings. And the good news is there's great alignment between how we've allocated our time and the priorities we established uh, last January uh, in our commission meeting. Um, I think that there are two things that looking at those minutes that um, stand out as the ones that consume the most amount of time, and that had to do with hiring a new director and something that you won't find on the priority list, but yet it's woven through every one of the 11 items, and that is budget work. Tremendous amount of budget work this year. But I think when you take a look at the body of all of that, when you take a look at, I think, uh, 24 pages of documents our staff has prepared to document accomplishments, it's not only been a busy year, but it's been a very successful year. And I think we've made progress on virtually all of our priorities. And I want to start out by saying that and acknowledging all of the hard work that's gone into my being able to say that. And that includes staff, that includes the ELT, that includes line staff out in the field, that includes our work at the committee level, our work as a commission working together. Um, I want to just say that uh, in terms of highlights, um, our number, it, you know, we didn't rank our priorities in priority order last year. But I don't think it's a coincidence that number one on the list was, and the document actually said, find someone who will lead Washington State Park successfully into the future in the role as our agency director. I do think it's worth uh, noting that Thanks to Don Hawk, we took our time. There was no rush. We brought in appropriate resources, internal and external, including the consultant to help us. Uh, we did a national search, and I am confident that we found someone who will lead Washington State Parks into the future successfully, and I think she's already moved us in that direction. Um, the second amount of time, again, ironically in a way, you don't see our, our list of priorities was our work on the budget. And I don't think I can underscore how much time was required at all levels of the organization to bring forward the package that we finally adopted in terms of robust, full-on, two-year capital and operating budget. And I think I've already said this twice, but one more time, a tremendous amount of work by our staff, the commission, our committees. This was sort of an all hands on deck effort to bring us to the point where we were able to advance those proposals. Um, and in the end, we sent to the governor and OFM the largest budget <laughs> ask, both operating and capital in the history of the agency. Uh, you know, we really went uh, all out uh, on the capital side in particular. We decided to, to go big. And our proposal on the capital side, and I know you've all read the materials that have been sent to us in advance, uh, but in case you, you forgot the number, the capital budget that we handed off to OFM and the governor, 802 pages. I mean, think of the amount of work it took to amass a budget proposal that's founded upon 802 pages of documentation. On the operating budget side, our request is 199 pages. That's 1,001 pages that supports our ask on the operating and the capital side. And so when we voted to approve those budgets and submit them to the governor and OFM, it's just really important to understand that there literally were dozens of employees of this agency, dozens and thousands of hours of work that went into uh, what is really a two-year cycle, but is always a challenge, and this year I think was done well, and I'm hopeful that we'll hear good news when the governor puts his budget forward here within the next 10 days. Uh, but again, I just can't thank our staff enough, and I want them to understand that we recognize the amount of work that went into developing those budgets. A few other really high-level comments drawing on our priorities, and I hope you agree with all of this, on the DEI front, I think when you look at the 
training, the planning that we've done, the partnering that we've done, the detail included in these documents, uh, it can be said that we've made progress. And I'm optimistic that there's a lot more ground that will be uh, covered in the months and years ahead. Uh, I also am happy to see in the report from staff examples of how we followed up on the two studies that we took time to learn about in our workshops this year relative to barriers to bringing people into our farms. Uh, tribal affairs, a lot of work was done in this regard. We will have our tribal affairs coordinator on board soon, and I'm hoping that in addition to the progress we made this year, there'll be lots of progress that we will hear about and participate in next year. I do want to say again, when you think about our staff and their work, it is no small feat that we hired 190 permanent employees this year. And so, you know, our hats off to everyone that contributed to pulling that off. Uh, just an absolute Herculean effort, I know we would all agree, 190 permanent employee positions were filled this year. I think we're all excited, uh, excited about the uh, new branding effort, uh, the website we designed. I think for the director, uh, has spent so much time hiring, filling positions, and a restructure of the ELT that we'll hear more about in a few moments. I don't know if Owen Owen is with us, but I give him a lot of credit for this, although a number of us helped in different ways. But I think we dodged a bullet in terms of that uh, Discover Pass holiday mandate that was included in one or more of the budget proposals that were approved by the legislature, fortunately not finally approved through our intervention and some really good work led uh, by Owen. Um, we spent a lot of time on cross-state trails. You're going to see in these documents that we're going to review in a few moments. Um, more progress on that front than probably in the agency's history. And lots more to do, but I do want to acknowledge that. Um, I think uh, all of us um, greatly enjoyed the opening of the Beverly Bridge. Uh, I think that you'll all agree that I gave one of the best speeches I ever had in 40 to 50 mile, 50, 40 to 50 mile hour gust of wind. Uh, but uh, hundreds of people there and uh, that project, um, I think symbolized the commitment and the progress we've made on the trails front. And then of course, uh, the icing on the cake was getting over to Tico and being able to participate with that community in a project that wouldn't have happened without the support of that community. So on the cross-state uh, trail uh, program and also the trail in our parks, I think we made significant progress. Um, one of our priorities dealt with making significant progress on Miller's Peninsula, uh, Westport Lighthouse, Lake Sam, Lake Island, and the Squally. You have detail in your packet that will be in a few moments that suggest that we did make progress on all of those fronts. I'm not sure that I would assign the word significant progress though to all of them, but that goes to the very difficult terrain associated with moving those projects forward. And not for lack of effort, not for lack of commitment by us, but I do think overall there was progress made on those fronts. Uh, climate, having a new climate sustainability coordinator, that didn't just happen, it was a decision package we made, it was an ask we made of the legislature, they agreed and funded that position, and hopefully we've done so much work in this regard, but hopefully having this kind of a resource available to us with an exclusive focus on climate and sustainability that uh, we'll be able to make even more progress in the years ahead. And then finally, lots of work needed, but lots of work accomplished on the interpretation front. And here again, um, we decided to go big. We had, we're asking for 15 FTEs, as I require, to beef up our interpretive program. And we'll see how the legislature, we'll see how the governor responds to that in just a few days. Uh, so these are just some of the things that I pulled from, again, looking at the minutes, our focus, uh, our action items, our priorities to pull together to try to make it hopefully set the stage for uh, us for the rest of this morning which is largely focused on, again, our accomplishments and hearing from staff. And so, um, being 10 minutes ahead of schedule, uh, 
Uh, I'll stop talking, and I think that we're going to turn this over to our director to get into the weeds on uh, priorities and accomplishments uh, from 2022. Director? Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, in front of you, you should have a document from 2022 Commission Identifying Priorities. It's about um, 15 pages long. And this is sort of um, a longer list of accomplishments um, that, that we've, uh, of efforts that we've put towards the 2022 uh, priorities. I know that we've had conversations about how these priorities will lead into 2023 as well. We'll have a, a more robust discussion about that um, later today. Um, but I did want to go over uh, some of these identified priorities, the work, the work that has been done, sort of highlight some of the, the things on the list. If there are questions um, or clarifications that anyone uh, has regarding some of these, I, I don't want to do like a reading of the, the phone book, if you will, and read through everything you have them in front of you, but just if there's some discussion items or, or any piece of, points of interest that uh, one of the commissioners may have, we have staff here that are able to uh, answer some questions. And But I just wanted to, 15 pages is a pretty, pretty substantial document considering um, the amount of change that the agency has been through over the last year. Again, something we'll talk about a little later this afternoon, but um, we have org charts that we'll go through. And Heather, who is some, I think she was hired as the new development director because of her unknown mad highlighter skills. But um, the org charts are, are, that you have in front of you, it's highlighted of all the new people. And I've really kind of considered you about two years or three years or less in this agency. And there's some vacancies that are highlighted in there as well. There's a couple of people who are still transitioning out of their positions into different positions or um, uh, moving out from the agency. And in some of these, uh, specifically in operations and parks development, there are huge, there, there's a huge amount of, of changeover in, in these uh, divisions, which has certainly had an impact on our ability to meet commission priorities. That being said, there is a 15-page list in front of you of all that has been done um, uh, for the agency. So it's been a sort of a, an interesting year as, as my first year to, to have this document in front of us and say, what, you know, what, what are we accomplishing here? Where are we going? And just looking at the work that's being done by um, all of our staff. Did staff get a copy of this? We just made enough for commissioners. There should be, we, we have extra, so you can certainly get it. You want to go over to that table and. Um, we can, uh, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, but I don't want to detract. I know the visual of the org charts is pretty you know, uh, interesting, and I hope, it, I hope it works for you. But um, I mean, it tells a story. And I think that everything that we talked about today is going to be influenced by this story in, in one way or another. And how we're, what we've done this year and how we're looking at next year and the opportunities that run in front of us um, as we look into 2023. I would though like to go back to the commission identified priorities and um, just kind of go through some of, some of the things that um, Chair Brown had talked about um, regarding what was happening in the action items for commission meetings. The, um, we just took these in the same priority list that you had them listed, so there's no internal prioritization of, um, of anything in here. Um, you did recruit and hire a new director, that's me. Thank you very much, very appreciative of that. <laughs> um, and then expand the system of usable cross state and in park trails for capital maintenance programs and through partnerships with governmental agencies, nonprofits, and user groups. So what's interesting here is it's cross-state and in-park trails. I think the vast majority of uh, time and energy was probably spent on the Volusia Cascades Trail this year, deservedly so, there's no, no judgment in that statement. But we do have a significant amount of trails in park, a significant amount of cross-state trails. And so, you know, looking at broadening our scope a little bit and making sure that we're, we're hitting all the elements that we need to will be critical as we move forward. Um, 
most of you were there, uh, if not all of you, at um, the Beverly Bridge opening, uh, the Tico Trestle opening, which Mark, I don't recall you giving a speech in pouring rain. Did, did oh, you did yeah, that well, that one. we were in the community center. Right? Th that's right, that's right. So we were, we were just right. stoked <laughs> uh, when we heard that speech. But um, just looking at the um, impact that I think that the Palooza Cascade has across the state is going to be an important thing as, as we look forward. Um, Lisa Anderson joined us in January as the new statewide trails program manager. Um, new to her position, you'll see her highlighted on one of the org charts. Um, and then she had a couple of shifts. The position was originally meant to report to the director. It was then moved to parks development, then the better operations. So, as we're as we're um, as you had mentioned, Chair Brown, it's not only adding new people, but there has been some reorganization happening as well and trying to right size and find the right fit for specific elements in here to make sure that the work that we're doing is, uh, that we have some um, strategy behind the work that we're doing and that we have some direction uh, so that the, our, some of our newer program managers aren't sort of left to their own devices to be like, what, what am I doing? It needs to come from the top down. And so that restructuring has been an important part in trying to fill those, those gaps. Um, there's obviously been great uh, maintenance work. We heard from the maintenance crew, from Ryan Layton and his crew. We're doing some great work out in Eastern Washington um, regarding um, uh, redoing some of the trestles. I, John helped me out here with, I think there were some that we lost in uh, wildland fires and other natural events, and then just some long-standing work that needed to be done. Washouts. Washouts, thank you. Um, so it was great. Um, I always appreciate it when the maintenance team presents at commission meetings because they have the best pictures. Uh, and you can really see those before and after type shots really make a, a significant difference. But, but they, did a, they did a great job. Um, there was also, not to, um, to go off the Palooza Cascades for a little bit, we, we did get some work done on the Clickitat Trail. There was some work done on the Willowton Hills Trail. And then I think, let's see, um, some safety items here, decked and safety railing on the Will of the Hills Trail. Um, an overpass uh, completed for 75% uh, completed for State Route 6. So some really large safety measures here for not just keeping our visitors safe, but I think for an overall better user experience. So um, we, we do have a, I think we did a great job of looking at the, um, the statewide trail system. Um, something that's, that's sort of looming over us, I think, long term is the Great American Rail Trail, and that will be something we need to keep in mind as we, um, as we look at the uh, um, long term health of the Palooza Cascades Trail. I, did, I don't want to, again, just sort of sit here and, and read through um, a phone book, but you can see that there are some regional highlights in some of our smaller in park trails, not just the long, uh, linear trails. Um, but I did want to give commissioners an opportunity if you had questions or concerns or um, just need some clarification on any of the items that, were, that are on the, your first priority.
where um, there was a woman there who spoke about accessibility and what that meant. She was in a wheelchair and she talked about it. You know, if, the, if there's a two minute step, that is a, um, a, a trail that is no longer accessible. And the parking lot, and the trail to the trailhead needs to be accessible as well. So there are all these things that are kind of percolating up here about how do we define that? What are deliverables? What are metrics that we can put towards that? Yeah. Is the, uh, And 
I came into this position without an MBA or um, you know a high level executive uh, experience. So I um, I researched the heck out of it. <laughs> and one of the things that I that I've really been focusing on is employee engagement um, because. Uh, there's this great quote I found that um, I just love, Mike's probably sick of hearing it, but is a culture eats strategy for breakfast. So if you do not have a great work culture, it do, I don't care how good your strategy is, it, it's, not, it's not going to work well. I think that there is a, um, uh, something playing out on a large scale today with Twitter that is an actual, a, a pretty good uh, summation of that. So. Um, so how do we develop culture, right? How do we how do we create a good culture? So there's a myriad of ways of doing that, and um, but one of the things is in with engagement is people want to work at a job that is meaningful to them. And when people come to parks, almost every single interview that I've sat in, whether it's for a park aide or um, an EL team member, the one thing that people have in common is I really want to work for parks. I love you guys, right? I love the mission. I love the idea of working for state parks. So we, we have a built-in in there, but we, you can't just rest on your laurels with that, right? Alignment with goals and letting people know how the work that they're doing moves that goal forward or achieves that, that certain strategy is one of the number one reasons for, employee, for high employee engagement. So this is part of that when you're talking about, it's one thing to say we made progress. I think that's meaningful to people. But when you can put some sort of detail behind that on the progress that you did make, and you specifically were responsible for, for ticking that up, even if it's two ticks, it, it doesn't matter. People still feel like, oh, I see, I'm completely engaged in, in watching this metric. And it's not, I mean, and, 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 Performance metrics can also have sort of a, a dark past to them of if you don't meet this certain number, then we're going to fire you or cut your pay or, or make you work even harder. Uh, that is, you know, there's a, it's, it's, it can be a double-edged sword, but making sure that we're putting the human element into it, the, the thing um, that I, I kept thinking about in, in looking at the opportunities for 2023 is you cannot forget the human element of any of this. It is the most critical piece to us moving forward. So it's it's a challenge, certainly, because of all the newness that we have. The newness is a great opportunity. It's also a bit of a, a threat or a weakness because we have to engage these people. And engaging them is not just saying, here's your project list. But what does your project list mean? What does it mean to our visitors? What does it mean to our commission? What does it mean to, to for us to go to um, the legislature as an, um, an accountable government agency and how we are using our people, how we are using our funding in order to achieve the goals that have been set by our commission. So your point is certainly not lost on me. Please know that it's a critical it's an internal discussion. Yeah, um, right there. <laughs> and when, when uh, Bruce Bounds uh, mentioned uh, we're looking out for that, mm -hmm. that's, that to me is the it's a good abstraction point to talk to an employee about. This is just re rehab a break. You know, what you're doing, meet these 250 residents in this small town that yes. they're struggling with and how you're helping them back to the It's just a little bit of what you're talking about. So yeah, I, yeah, and I, I think just making sure that we're celebrating those wins in some way, shape, or form. Um, one thing that, that I learned working as an area manager. I myself do not require a lot of um, pats on the back or, or anything, and so it's it's a muscle that I don't exercise really well because I just don't. An attaboy can go a long way, and I just I just don't think of that because I it's not something that I've ever um, uh, uh, thought about for me. However, I learned that it it's incredibly meaningful to many, many people. And the 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 buy-in that you get or the just that sense of somebody just sort of standing a little taller or or smiling for a moment of wow, that recognition was really important. And I think it's one of the things that in the day to day of trying to accomplish all of these things that um, we sometimes forget. 
And so building a culture of appreciation, whether it's through positive accountability or, um, or, or just uh, team, teamwork, you know, team culture, uh, that that will be as critical to our success as establishing the metrics um, uh, to accomplish. Um, oh, so yes, yeah, so, uh, and then grant funding, and we'll, we'll move on to number three, which is significant progress on major planning activities, including Miller Penn, Westport Light, Nisqually, Lake Sam, and Lake Island. Um, a couple of these uh, uh, projects have obviously taken the lion's share of the staff time that we have, and also some large goals in our planning staff. Um, and a lot of change in parks development has also, um, maybe we haven't moved the needle as much as we would have liked to on all of these uh, um, uh, categories or all of these projects. Um, and we've talked a lot about that, but I do want to give an opportunity if you have questions about any of the items that are on this list or um, that we'd be happy to I, I have two. This uh, element uh, off. Um, one uh, on Lake Island State Park. Um, I'm hoping that we can bring this before the commission in workshop early next year and get a more of a focus on this. I think we we've not had the kind of focus that we as the commission should. Uh, it's it's a, a big challenge that we face there. I was happy to read about these consultations and other elements of progress. You know, I didn't realize that we actually had a report to look at uh, development alternatives. I don't think we've seen that. So that's just a request that we put that on the workshop. And then this second item, uh, I actually brought a prop along. Uh, I, this is not a criticism. This is really more of a question. But I'm concerned about the way the Miller Peninsula status is being characterized by us as a cause. Uh, I mentioned this to a commissioner yesterday and uh, was telling him that uh, there was a person who is uh, an advocate for development of the park who actually sent this to me and was upset because Miller Peninsula State Park study decision has been paused. It suggested, I don't know how to say it, but it suggested that we were kind of stepping back, that it, it wasn't still full speed ahead. Now, full speed ahead has some funding gaps that have to be addressed. I understand that. But I, I just had flagged that in here and coincidentally gotten this uh, from, a, from a gentleman up in he actually lives in Swim and suggested that we might want to think about how we represent uh, the chronology of developing this park uh, in some way other than to refer to it as a pause. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yes. It, it, it's just a concern that I have. So those are the two things that I have. Uh, anybody else want to ask questions or have comments on, on this third element of this report? Second, the, the uh, point about Lake Island, I can make sure we focus in on that. If we're making, if we're doing that, I assume we're continuing the process to figure out what they really want to do. Uh, and I hope we've got sort of pretty wide open parameters on that at some point. Absolutely. Well, so for Lake Island, so um, you guys can see through the org chart you see that parks development and planning has like entirely changed over the last year. Uh, fortunately, earlier this week, we offered two new park planner four positions. So I think the goal in the early next year will be to get staffed up and start allocating staff to these projects. I mean, a lot of the reason that you don't see a ton of progress is that we just haven't even had staff capacity. The entire planning team has changed over the last year through promotions and other things. So. I think we'll be staffing that project if you all decide to continue it as a priority. And I also think that we would like to wait until the tribal liaison is hired and brought on board because they could be a really instrumental figure in helping us negotiate and navigate the sort of tribal landscape. You know, there might be more than one tribe 
that's interested if you all want to consider what that type of programming. So that was sort of the idea that we would assign a new staff person to it and wait for the tribal liaison to come on board to help us with those aspects. So it might not be January, but it could be March. Did you want to add something to that? I was just thinking of the conversation we're having too about uh, looking at all the current planning priorities yeah. that are out there and I think one observation is I'm, uh, as some of these planning priorities, I'm not saying these specific ones have come about, I don't think there's always been a, here's the resources we have, here's the priorities, what can be done, it's, right. here's a list of things we want to do right. uh, and let's see how it plays out and so we're really trying to, now I don't want to use the word pause. Uh, but, but thinking about um, okay, what are what is our current resource situation? What are all these priorities? So let's do five of these well instead of ten of them, where we're getting at the end of the year and saying where, where are we? Uh, and that's not a, a long process, but, uh, but it is something that we're talking about right now. We're really encouraged about getting these two planners um, on. That's the full staff now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that's going to help accelerate. Uh, but we do need to be taking a look at all of these things as we're looking at the next year. Uh, what do we actually have for resource? What are the priorities? And let's set ourselves up for success um, instead of sort of professional people. And we have budget requests. We have more budget. We've asked for additional park planners, but we need, like we asked for an additional park planner for, but they would be dedicated to ADA coordination. We don't have somebody that's 100% dedicated to ADA in our agency, so we need that. Um, we are for a park planner for to help support. Um, I mean, one of the things that you all have recognized is that you know we have a higher pre appropriation rate, and part of that is that we go to ask somebody for construction before we've necessarily done all the scoping and all the RP studies and coordinated all those things. So, we're asking for a park planner to help get some of that work done on the front end so that when we ask for the money, we're ready, we're actually ready to construct. Um, but not specifically to work on master planning projects. And I just wanted to add to, to Mike's comments, you know, which I really appreciate about the getting clear on our priorities. You know, it's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of inputs and different people that come to us with ideas about what they want to do, and so sometimes the planners get pulled off of what has been put on the piece of paper to go deal with something else that maybe a legislature want, legislator wants us to respond to. So getting really clear about what our priorities are and trying to have some fidelity to them would be extremely helpful. And I think uh, if we have commissioners that haven't been to Blank Island, we should try to facilitate getting all commissioners to, be, to, to visit Blank Island and get a sense of the magnitude <laughs> facilities that are there and the challenges we face. So, so I'm not quite sure where this comment sort of best fits in, in this today's conversation, but um, I think maybe throw it out here now. Um, you know, in the state of Washington, you, you know, we, I think as part of our DEI goals, you know, we do want more diverse users. And, um, you know, when I'm as a commissioner, I'm always, you know, it's important that staff have a, have a great work experience and so forth, but ultimately we are here for the residents of the state of Washington to enjoy this outdoor experience and cultural experience. So as we're prioritizing projects, well, one more, one more data point on that is if you go to the OSPI website, you will see that nearly half the students in the state of Washington are low income and half are students of color. So to what extent as we're prioritizing projects do those sort of questions come into play? Because you know DEI can't just be an internal thing. It's you know it's and, and some of that has to do with you know decisions we're making about the, the you know the projects we're going to take on and the improvements we're going to make and so forth. So I just and I this might not be the right place in the conversation. Well, just just quickly, one of the the reasons of hiring a DEI director was so that we add this lens to what we're looking at. 
And it's the same thing with putting stewardship on, on the executive team and the stewardship training that Lisa and her team just completed um, over the state is that it's it's not a it's not a piece of what we do that we have to remember. It's a lens through which you view every single project that we're doing. It and so it's something that's it's certainly a new muscle that, that we need to exercise. It's it's not something that at least I'm aware of that we've done before in, in sort of a, a systematic way. Um, um, I'm sure it's been done in certain projects for sure. But again, those long-term goals of what we're trying to accomplish in 2023, or, or what are we putting in front of us? What are what are what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? Having that DEI perspective is probably a weakness right now. So how do we turn that into a strength? We've hired a director who's looking at, um, who's done things internally, so our staff is, is starting to think that way and look with that perspective. Um, we're engaging in user groups and we've had a couple of studies done through the State Park Foundation. So it's becoming more of our vernacular, which I think will is, is the first step to, to us getting there. But really looking programmatically about solving those issues is something that, that we need to do better at, that we haven't quite started down that path. But it's it's not, it's a point we'll take. And just a, a comment on that, uh, I think it's related, it's not correct. Uh, but uh, when I think about Lake Island, I think about the surrounding communities. King County, Seattle, Bash on it's at. Uh, and uh, you know, we spent a lot of energy talking about, and, and I know Peter did, uh, talking about Lake Sam as a gateway park uh, for the state park system. In some respects, Lake Island would be that as well for a different kind of experience. And I guess my question is when we get into the planning part of this, I would throw out here get some kind of round table discussion with the King County Parks people and Seattle Parks people and the Kitsap Parks people and Bainbridge Parks people and Vashon and get some understanding as, uh, get some ideas about what could this asset, this asset be that could provide opportunities for the three million people that live around it. Uh, just a, a point of History of the early 1900s, almost in the Vermont, wanted Mercer Island to be a park of the Seattle Park system. It would have been a great park, which is now probably a $20 billion yellow in terms of its real estate value. But, uh, you know, that, you know, I know there's not a highway to get you there, like, like Sam, you know, with a car to go back behind it. But you can get there if you want to get there, and you can set up a system. Um, this um, list 
And then, because um, I don't want to, I don't want to throw off Mark's schedule because I'll be in trouble. But um, well, I don't <laughs> steal in my thunder tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so if you do have a question about this, but anything in particular, or um, um, so it was. I mean, I guess. So you mentioned you mentioned a couple of times the staffing issue, and I am very interested in like I don't want to do them separately, but um, you know, I mean, it is rather dramatic, right? <laughs> um, looking at, at, at this particular sheet, um, in, and then and, you know, it's a lot of new people. There's still a bit of vacancies. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I just don't know. I'm not really sure what the question is, but it does. I wanted this just maybe be like you know. Talk. What are we looking at in terms of the, I want I want to sort of give you space to talk about how this is going. <laughs> if that makes sense, especially relative to you know what was done accomplished, it's very significant in a lot of accomplishments. Um, you know, when you can you know, I think it's especially more significant when you look at this sheet and there's like literally an entire column that's that's been highlighted. Um, which is amazing, frankly. <laughs> um, it's like there's the two people, oh my goodness, they must feel like um, uh, very special being the only golf island in the world at how long. But um, how is that? How is that been going? Like any, anything that you want to say about that? I just wanted to. Now, is that something for this element relative to the development of these parks that would be better? I think we can. I think we. I think I would love to talk about how it's going, like at length. Um, I think that so we can talk about this point, later this yeah. afternoon. Yeah, I thought we'd love the opportunity to kind of share thoughts about. Yeah, what we can, what we've been we can, experiencing and where I hope we're going? Yeah. We can be flexible, but yeah. I think the idea this morning would focus on accomplishments in the current year. So I think this in this order and then there'll be an opportunity. And we've got a lot more time, but I mean I'm yeah. a bunch of shock if there's anything on the accomplishments on the fix. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I feel like this would be a very good shoot. Yeah. We'll talk about that Jenga tomorrow. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay moving to <laughs> Uh, moving on, uh, the next uh, commission priority um, was around diversity, equity, and inclusion in um, continued efforts, actions, and commitments that integrate DEI practices into all aspects of our agency. Um, so Jeanette's been with us, our uh, new DEI director, since uh, October 1st. Um, and there's a, a actual pretty robust list of, of things that are in the hopper right now, but I didn't know if anybody had any questions or comments um, regarding our efforts in, in DEI? Uh, well, on this year, um, yeah, I, I mean, I was impressed with uh, continuing that, uh, what you said earlier, about uh, seeing everything through the lens, uh, I think it shows. to me, so that's oh, what that's each right. ELT member gave me. It's just broken up. In January, you will get a final list that Amanda's going to make look very nice and professional. This was done quickly over Thanksgiving while I was at training. So, I, I only have one question on this uh, element. One of the two studies on barriers to inclusion was actually a legislative proviso. 
is, has there been follow-up with the legislature by us and others? That was specific to state parks and barriers. What have we shared with the legislature in terms of the results of that study? Um, I don't think anything. I don't know that there's been follow-up. I wonder if, if that's appropriate because some of the things that we're already doing and others downstream will have dollar bills associated with their dollar bill signs associated with them. And so it's more of a question about whether there is some appropriate follow-up that might be warranted. Okay. Even an opportunity to talk to a legislative committee about the findings of these two studies. We did, um, Owen and I briefly talked with um, Representative Ryu's committee um, on Friday, and she had asked a question about um, how diversity is looking at state parks, okay. and, and so we spoke briefly about that. We didn't okay. speak specifically about okay. that, and I do know that the, there have been a lot of questions about our decision package for our DEI budget. Um, Laura has fielded many um, uh, uh, additional questions from that uh, uh, ask. So I know that conversations are, have been happening. I think John Steiner has been involved in some of those conversations as well. So we've certainly um, created a, um, some interest in what we asked for. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out. But I'll follow up okay. with Owen um, on that. Okay. Just one comment on the no child budget size mm -hmm. program. I think that's a Great program. I'm glad to see over the last few years that there's been more and more funding for that program. And I'd like to see that continue uh, because I think that's one of the few opportunities that some kids are really a chance to go on to that system. Absolutely. Um, so, Melinda Posner, former um, our interim DEI director, is um, heading up No Child Left Inside. So, it is in very good hands with the state. But it's a great program to get a lot of um, interest and in, I think we had more uh, grant asks this year than there have ever been. So uh, we'll see how the funding goes. I want to pile on to Commissioner Levin, which I don't understand. But I think the cap holding the capital account up on 25 and follow up on the Jewish situation is another opportunity. Your kids might not otherwise have a chance to actually experience what it's like to be camping in a national environment and, and being an island. It's even more remote to say we match the law before Miller's a day again. Yeah, and there's another the benefit of the no travel up inside is that those initiatives are coming at the local level. So yes. those, those people know where those the, the young people are mm -hmm. and that it's that connection I think at the local level that's really Yeah. You, know, you have ideas about what you want to do to be more inclusive, but you can't you know, achieve it. There's also sort of the specter of um, outreach <coughs> for all pain over us. So we haven't received any information really on what that's going to look like, how that's going to be funded, what the whole project is going to be, but um, we expect that it's going to have, that we're going to play some part in, in what that looks like, and it, whether it's sort of a new no child left inside or or something different that will be another opportunity for us to engage in, in um, underserved communities coming out of the parks. So, the question I was going to ask, we probably have to play by the one that I didn't ask, and we moved on, so we can move on to the other one. Yep. Okay, so why don't we move on to priority five, climate? Lisa might be the, the better person to actually talk about this. I, I haven't had a ton of interaction with Ryan Carlson, but again, if you look at your stewardship uh, um, org chart, he, he is new in his position. He was our interpretive program manager for many years, and this is actually what Ryan did his um, graduate work in, was on sustainability. So I don't, if, if you have questions on this, um, I, I probably punt to Lisa a little bit, um, but I do, do know that, that a lot of it is pretty formulaic from the governor's office and is meeting um, uh, things that have been put in front of us and not necessarily our 
um, uh, project management and we're going to do this and we're going to look at that. So it's, um, I, I, I don't know when Ryan started around March or April, so he's still very new into understanding what all of this looks like for us as we move forward. Okay, questions on this element of our priorities. All right, then the next is um, interpretation. So, um, interpretation is uh, near and dear to my heart as a former teacher. Um, we asked for, again, this is sort of a uh, forum discussion this afternoon, but asked for a large budget package to um, uh, further our interpretive efforts. Um, and then, obviously, we, we have made some some huge, uh, I think, leaps forward in interpretation since COVID. Um, the, the last three years have sort of opened up a, a world of opportunities as far as a multimedia approach um, to, to what interpretation looks like. It's not just the, what, what would Ryan say, the stage on the stage, uh, uh, necessarily where you go to an amphitheater and sit and, and watch something. And not to say that those programs aren't still very important and, and very meaningful to our on the ground staff, um, but um, really looking at how we can, you know, my my delusion of grandeur is the first five minutes of every Washington State school child's day is in a park, and remotely we can accomplish that. Logistically, I'm not quite sure how that happens, but um, but. I think that criticalness of getting children involved in parks from a very young age and really understanding that they are their parks and these are places where they can go um, is really important. In the meantime, um, we continue to put, to put a really great effort into all of our interpretive opportunities. I was able to go to the party park at Rival Trails this year where we had an interpretive booth. And um, I still owe Amber Brooks a, a new setup because they did they had their pop up and some tables and everything. But we have these nice things where we can put you know with our name on them and we can put maps or pictures on them. So when you go to a booth, you know exactly who you're engaging with. And and so I um, um, want to make sure that the people our interpreters out there are getting some money to do that to do a proper job of um, marketing themselves while while people are out there. But um, we continue with some great efforts with the Girl Scouts Love State Parks. Um, we, um, our traditional, um, uh, Folk and Traditional Arts Program has uh, had a, some really great uh, successes this year. Um, we have six new FTEs, in, uh, mostly in parks, uh, um, that are dedicated to interpretation. And just a lot of, just sort of, other events that have happened throughout the system. So um, I don't know if you have any questions about anything that's. And you feel that uh, position by the partnership with Brian? Uh, well, we hired a new interpretive program manager, Emily Jacobs. So the, so she replaced, she took Ryan Carlson's old position. So she's been brought on board and has a long history of interpretation. And I think we'll have a larger role in sort of this sort of what is the park wide kind of vision for interpretation. We also were able to fund internally two new folks to support um, one website updates. So updating the stories on our web pages because we're doing the website refresh. So making sure that that information is accurate and we're telling the right stories. Um, and then someone else to help on the capital side with all of the sort of exhibits and facilities types upgrades that we're trying to do. Like Mount St. Helens Visitor Center and other places where we have Interpretive content facilities. So that position with the partnership and planning program. That was my old position. Um, uh, yep, we have decided. I was just thinking, at Diana, for you to go ahead. So this hasn't. We're still rolling it out to staff. So all of the staff in my division doesn't know this and this isn't being broadcast right but we have decided to appoint Nikki Fields um, and we're going to combine planning and real estate and Nikki Fields who's currently the real estate program manager who was the lead planner for many many years for state parks will be assuming the role of planning and real estate program manager. 
It's just being changed. Partnerships is coming out and will report directly to me.
new bill stand adjourned until 10.45 a.m.
But if it's if it's if it has become that because of that interaction and it's and it's growing something new that that used to be um, that used to proliferate an area and no longer does, you know, it may have not originally been there, but we've created a situation where it's there again, and do we have an ethical responsibility because now it's something that was missing that has by happenstance occurred, even though it wasn't natural to begin with. I mean, we can. I can go down this rabbit hole pretty far. That's, uh, that's the issue. That's exactly that's, the issue is how do we answer that question in a day as opposed to the potential for it dragging out and dragging out and dragging out. It's, it's hurting the people who are trying to develop the project who appear to want to just simply mitigate and do the right thing, but this isn't fair. It's what it I mean, I guess I, I mean, I, I was wondering if we're the people who have that I mean, maybe we could, um, but I think you know, outside the philosophical question, like we have legal obligations. So apparently, somebody is going to have this discussion. <laughs> it seems maybe not when they decided to write the. When me not us, I mean, at some point when they decided, you know, requirements around SIPA and requirements around looking at the, the you know, the, the the land as it is now. Um, my understanding is there's also just sort of like external legal obligations and at some point someone can make a decision about what we do or we don't have to maintain from a legal perspective separate from sort of the philosophical discussion. Um, so I don't even know where the place is at that discussion because it just makes me that like it's a little bit like somebody else, it's like an external decision that's been placed on us regardless of what we think of it, but, you know. Um, and I don't know why they made that decision. I mean, it'd be interesting to see, you know, just as a policy person, for instance, policy in like my day job, a lot of times we do look at the debate that happened at the time the law was created in order to sort of understand why they did that. And it would be sort of interesting to see why it was written that way. I do wonder if there is some history there. But that being said, I feel like it's also just yeah. <laughs> some of our perspective is like that's just what it is. It's like I you know it's a great but point. this is not contemplated in statute. If there is no law to leave that. Lisa, did you have anything you wanted to contribute? Sure, I'd, I'd love to jump in here. I mean, I think the first thing that I would like to bring up is the fact that our coasts are very dynamic systems. And in reality, regardless of the history of this particular site and bulldozers, there wouldn't be land there without human intervention. Land exists at West Court Light for multiple reasons. Um, not the least of which is the creation of the jetty at the um, mouth of Grace Harbor. So it's a highly manipulated system. You know, Commissioner Milner, you talked about dunes on the Great Lakes. We wouldn't naturally really have the dune systems that we have on the Washington coast at all without the introduction of non-native beach grasses. Um, so it's a highly manipulated system as a result of um, human activities. There's no question about it. And we had some very interesting um, philosophical discussions when we were working with the consultants on restoration opportunities, because what are you restoring to? Um, because on the one hand, you could say that naturally this entire site would be ocean. That's what we'd be restoring it to. <laughs> um, without human intervention, we wouldn't have land there at all. So it's not a straightforward conversation by any means. Um, I think it's easy to say that you go in and you've taken in a bulldozer and you end up with a plant community in short order that is significant and unusual there. So it doesn't matter because that's a result of human intervention. It's all a result of human intervention um, and natural systems are dynamic. So on some level, we have to step back and think what is important, what function is it serving? Um, you know, conservation biology is by definition not only science, but it's latent in a value system of what it is we value, what we believe is important. And based on both our statutory requirements in terms of what the legislature has told us that we acquire and manage property for, as well as our mission, as well as our existing policies, we have chosen to, to look at things through a particular lens. So 
So, yes, you could say that this is hurting a community and this is up to debate. And I wish that I could see you, Commissioner Milner, while I'm having this conversation. <laughs> but, and I'd be happy to debate it with all of you for hours. It's not an easy question to answer. There is not a yes, if we disturb this, we'll lose the ability to cure cancer. No, I don't believe that's true, but it does come down to our agency ethic and what we stand for and what we believe is important. And I have my own take on that, and all of you as individuals have your own individual takes on that. How do we do that in a day? <laughs> That's the question. Okay, so at this point, we are going to uh, take, uh, we're going to, uh, let's see, we're going to recess this meeting and move to an executive session. Um, there is a requirement that I uh, bear with me as I read through this, please. We will now enter into an executive session to review the performance of a public employee pursuant to RCW 4231.10, subsection 1G. We will end of the executive session at 12 noon, and no action will be taken in the executive session. And at the conclusion of the executive session, we will reconvene an open public session, which will take us directly into lunch, and then we'll regroup after lunch. Uh, this meeting will be limited to commissioners and our director only. And so with apologies, I have to ask the rest of you to find some place to uh, continue your work, uh, but not in our process. <laughs> come feel, feel free to rejoin us obviously at noon. Uh, Lori, I hope that there's a way